When Parliament passed the Tea Act in May of 1773, it was not thinking about Massachusetts or Boston. It was thinking about India. And the British, had, British East India Company had just taken possession of most of India. An expensive proposition that left this company, the largest corporation in the world, heavily in debt. So they went to Parliament for a bailout. And Lord North offered them 15 million pounds, which they needed to make up their debt. In return, Lord North got to appoint the board of directors of the company. The company he thought was too big to fail, needed to be bailed out, and Parliament did so. Also, the East India Company was given the right, the power, to send all of its tea to North America where it would be sold and actually would sell for less than the tea already on the market here. Only a certain number of merchants would be designated to sell the tea in North America. And here in Boston, the Clark family and the sons of Thomas Hutchinson were among those designated to sell the East India tea. News of the Tea Act infuriated Americans who weren't among those able to sell the tea and also worried them about what other rights that they had would Parliament control. That is, if Parliament could decide who sold tea here and if Parliament could decide they would be taxed, what else could Parliament do? Or to put it in a different way, what couldn't Parliament do? So when news that these tea ships were on their way arrived here in the late summer of 1773, merchants began organizing. Merchants in Philadelphia, in New York, and other ports where the tea was going to arrive. And in September of 1773, the tea ships sailed from England. These were American ships that had gone to England to pick up other cargoes. They were instead taken by the East India Company to ship this tea to North America. Four ships were bound for Boston, each carrying about 200 or so chests of tea. Each chest weighed about 200 pounds. And it just happened that the tea ships reached Boston first. The Dartmouth, the Eleanor, the Beaver arrived in Boston in November of 1773. The town meeting convened. The Sons of Liberty were sent to patrol the ships, to take possession of the ships, make sure the tea was not unloaded. And everyone knew a clock was beginning to tick. Under British law, a ship could stay in port for 20 days without loading or unloading. After that, all of the goods aboard had to be taxed. We wanted to avoid having that tax paid. And the clock struck midnight on December the 17th. On the night of December 16th, mass meeting at Old South Meeting House, uh, people protesting the tea. We know what happened in that meeting. We don't know what was happening in three other places around town where small groups of men were getting together to, to destroy the tea. 50 to 150 men marched from Old South down to the waterfront, they boarded the ships, and methodically and with great precision, they unloaded the tea ship, sending men below to hoist up the cargo. Up on the deck, the cargo is split open, dumped into the harbor. All of the tea has to be destroyed. On one of the ships, someone broke a lock. Someone went into town to replace it. We want to make sure we're only destroying the tea and not anything else. One of the ships, the captain said, don't start with my ship because there's another cargo already sitting on top of the tea. I don't want anything to happen to that. These disguised townspeople said, we'll take care of the cargo. They very carefully unloaded this other cargo, placed it on the dock, and then went about destroying the tea. It was a very calm night. And as the tide came in, the chests of tea that were now st standing on the flats beside the ships began to rise and mounds of tea began rising in the harbor. Men went out in boats to destroy the tea, to push the tea under the water so all of it would be destroyed. Today this tea would be worth about 1.7 million dollars. It was quite an expensive proposition to destroy the tea. On one of the decks they saw a man actually filling his pockets with tea. They took his jacket as he tried to wrestle out of it, and they cut the lining open so all of the tea would fall into the harbor. We're not stealing the tea, we're destroying it. The next day, a notice was posted if he wanted to get his jacket back, it was nailed to the whipping post in Charlestown. So this was, John Adams said, 
the most sublime moment of all. The people, he said, should never rise without doing something memorable. And this was, Adam said, a rising of the people, the destruction of the tea. No one called it the Tea Party until much later, because they realized this is a very serious enterprise. Tea Party has kind of a happy connotation. This is a destruction of property. And once Parliament heard that the tea was destroyed, they cracked down on Massachusetts. They shut down the Massachusetts government. They suspended the government. They replaced Thomas Hutchinson, the governor of Massachusetts, with General Thomas Gage. And they shut the port of Boston. The port would remain shut until the tea was paid for. So this is the moment that precipitates the American Revolution. It's a protest over a tax on tea, a protest over Parliament awarding privileges to the East India Company. And the Parliament responds to the destruction of the tea by shutting the port of Boston. And that opens the question, will the other colonies side with Boston in this, or will they think this time the Bostonians have gone too far? And the work then begins for John Adams, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, to bring the other colonies in line with Boston and make sure that none of them will be subject to the whims of Parliament. So this is the Boston Tea Party, the destruction of the tea in December of 1773, an act of civil disobedience, demonstrating that in Boston, in Boston the Bostonians will have the power to govern themselves.